All right, so the title for my sermon tonight is Twisted Scripture. Twisted Scripture. And I'm starting off here in Matthew 16, where Jesus is giving his disciples a warning about the Pharisees. And in verse number six, the Bible says, Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And of course, then it goes on this whole thing how the disciples are thinking, oh man, we didn't bring any bread. And they're starting to just think, they hear the word leaven and they're just associating that with bread, thinking, oh man, we didn't bring enough bread for the trip or whatever. And then he, he rebukes them and corrects them and saying, no, this isn't talking about bread. It has nothing to do with bread. That's not what he's warning them about. Verse number 12, if you want to jump down there, it says, Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now, there are a lot of Pharisees and Sadducees out today. There are a lot of people who will claim the Lord as being their God. They'll claim the name of Jesus Christ as being who they turn to. They'll claim the Bible as being their source of information and, and what they believe is all coming from the Bible. But their Pharisees and their Sadducees and their doctrines are just full of leaven. And they're, they're bad doctrines, they're false doctrines. And what one of the things I noticed just in my Bible reading, in my Bible study, there's a, there's a certain pattern, there's different patterns and ways that people will try to abuse and twist Scripture. So we're going to go over that tonight. There's, there's one specifically of just where people will, will take Scripture you know, out of context or out of the spirit of what's being given. So there's, there's one element where, where a Pharisee or a Sadducee is going to take God's word and they'll, they'll remove this phrase and isolate it and you know, just build a whole doctrine around that. And then they start going into just a lot of logic and man's reasoning and, and coming up with, with all kinds of other details that are not found in Scripture. That's one way you're going to find false doctrine. And another way is to just yank a few verses out of context to try to prop up something where when you actually read it, it's not what it's talking about at all. It's totally separate. And I think we could, we, you know, we need to be careful, even, in, even us, of zooming in too much on certain... Like, every word of God is important. Believe me. I, I believe that. God said that. Right? Every word of God. That we, you know, we leave by every word of God. But we want to be careful not to isolate each word so much that where you're, you're zooming in so close that you don't see the forest for the trees. You don't, you don't see the great picture that God is trying to teach us because you've just zoomed in so close on one point that you're, you're coming up with things that aren't really there. And that, that happens quite a bit. So we're going to go through a couple of different examples that I found in Scripture of people abusing Scripture. And the first, the first place we're going to look at, turn if you would to Psalm 91, we're going to see Satan's attack on God's Word. Because believe it or not, Satan uses God's Word and will try to use God's Word against him. And this is very damaging. This is extreme. Like, it, it's... Um, in a sense, it's wise of Satan to be attacking God's word the way he does because it causes so much damage and destruction. Even if, you know, maybe we can see past the foolishness and, and, and the, the bad doctrine, just the fact that he's attacking his word in the way that he does and tries using scripture, it causes a lot of people to just get a lot of doubt and, oh, you say this and they say this and there's all these different denominations and everything just seems very confusing and no one really knows what they're talking about because everyone's saying something different and you have an interpretation and I have an interpretation. And, and how many times have you heard that before? Well, why should I believe your interpretation of this? Right? Like as, as if you just are coming up with something out of nowhere. Like, well, I just kind of think that this means whatever. And, and everyone's opinion is just as equal and valid as everyone else's, right? People get stuck with this type of a mindset and mentality because of those that are going out there and twisting Scripture and turning it around on its head. But obviously, you know, we try to tell those people, hey, look, you can actually know what this means. It's really not that difficult. Just because there's a lot of people that say a lot of different things doesn't make them all right or doesn't even make their opinion valid. It doesn't even make it make sense. God has given us a brain 
to understand and to discern. And his word really isn't that difficult to understand. And the first red flag is if you hear doctrines or something being taught that is hard, to, just really hard to follow and really difficult to understand, it's probably not true. I mean, 99% of the time, I would say it's probably just not true because God's word and the truth isn't that complicated and isn't that difficult. It doesn't mean there's no deep things or, or deep meanings in God's word. Of course there is. But it's still not going to be that difficult to, to understand and to prove. It, you know, people, I've heard this from the mostly the dispensational type crowds. They'll, you know, you really got to work for all this understanding and stuff. You, you know, you're working, I need to show yourself approved. So you need to divide up the word here and here and here. And God's got a little bit here and he's going to make you work for it. I've heard that before. No, God wants us to be workmen. We need to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Work men. He didn't say it's going to be a lot of work to cut and paste like different portions of scripture to try to make, to try to build some collage or, or um, what, what's that called when you, when you build the origami, where you build the, the animals like out of, out of paper, right? He, he's not telling us to divide all of this up to just come up with some other thing that's like not actually found in scripture. He just wants us to be able to put in our time, put in the effort, read the Word of God, study the Word of God, and go out and do the work that he's, that he's very simply commanding us to do. Now, you're in Psalm 91, because we're going to see Psalm 91 is quoted by Satan, but we're going to read Psalm 91 in context because this is how the vast majority of people who are trying to teach a false doctrine or trying to use Scripture even to get you to do something against God, that's, that's not right. That's what Satan was doing when he was tempting Jesus Christ. He was literally using Scripture to try to get Jesus to sin. To try to get Jesus to tempt God. And we'll see that when we get to, when we get to the New Testament. But And this is all, I'm, I'm probably going to bring this up multiple times. It's just, it's so important for you to read your Bibles. For you to read regularly, consistently, keep it fresh. I don't care how many times you've already read the Bible. You need to keep reading the Bible and reinforcing over and over again. And when you hear things, don't just accept them. Especially when you're talking to someone else about doctrine and they just come up with something that you're like, I don't know about this. Don't accept what they're saying about the Bible at, you know, as just being truth. Look it up. Read the whole thing in context. If someone says, oh yeah, but look at this verse. Look at this verse I got right here. Get it in context. This is where the 99% like, of false teachings and doctrines come from just people yanking out verses out of context. Psalm 91. Let's get the context of what's being said here. So look at verses number 1 and 2. The Bible says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. So just in those first two verses, what we see here is giving the context of God being the, the defense, God being the fortress, God being my strength. I'm going to trust in God. He is the one that I'm going to put my, my trust in and my place of refuge. He's my fortress. Right? That, that is defined in the context. Now let's jump down to verse number nine. Actually, you know what? Let's just read it all. So I'm not, so not going to be accused of yanking anything out of context. We're going to start focusing on verse nine, but let's keep reading here. Verse number three. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, 
There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. This whole psalm is just talking about how God, if you decide to put your faith, to put your trust in, in, into the Lord, he's saying, I'll protect you. I'm going to care for you. I'm going to watch out for you. I will be your defense. I will be your strength. I will make sure that, you know, bad things aren't going to happen to you, that I'll even go so far as to just make sure that if you're going to, you know, someone will fall, that the angels will be there to, to catch you up so you don't even harm your feet, right? This is what's being expressed in this psalm. You read the whole thing in context, and it's like, yeah, that's exactly what it's saying. Now, turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to see how Satan tries to use this passage to get Jesus to tempt the Lord. And it's easier to get people to fall for these traps, especially when you don't know, one, if you don't have it in context, but two, if you don't know the rest of Scripture, if you're just using one verse. Now, obviously, Jesus wasn't deceived. He knows the Bible. He knows the will of God. He is God in the He was God in the flesh, right? So there is no reason, uh, you know, it's not like he had to worry, but this is, the reason why we're going over this is because Satan, his attacks don't change. He uses the same tools that he's been using over, now he hones them and he perfects them and he gets them, I think, better and better over time to, to attack people, but he still uses these same tools. He uses them today. Because he's the author of confusion. He wants people to not understand the word of God. Look at verse number 5 of Matthew chapter 4. The Bible says, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. So what's he saying here? He's taking the passage that we just read, talking about God just offering his, his general protection over you. If you're going to trust in the Lord, well, God's going to protect you if you trust in him. And he's trying to tell Jesus, okay, well, why don't you just go up to this really high mountain and just, and just throw yourself off of it? Right? Like, hey, isn't it written that God's not going to, you know, let you dash your foot against a stone? That's not what God was saying at all. God's not saying, go do some really stupid thing to prove to somebody that you're really of God. And then I'll just make sure that nothing bad is ever going to happen. That's not what he's saying. That's not what the, the passage is teaching at all, but that's what, what he's trying to do. And Jesus answers him in verse 7. says, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So Jesus answers him then with more Scripture. He's not disputing that the Scripture says that, but the, the key element is that just because God is promising you protection doesn't mean it's okay to just get into all kinds of foolishness. The same way that just because God gives us eternal life and Jesus has paid for all of our sins doesn't mean it's okay just to get off in all kinds of sin. Then, well, let's just do all that. You know, it's foolishness. It's stupidity. It, it, and it's a foolish attitude that wants to deny the doctrine of once saved, always saved because people want to say, oh, well, then you could just go. Why don't you just sin then? Why don't you just party? Why don't you just live it up? Why don't you, you know, because... It is written, you know, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That's why. Because be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's why. We need to understand there's more to the Bible than, first of all, just that one, one verse or one sentence. We need to apply it all together. But two, just understanding what is this context talking about. Now turn, if you would, to Exodus chapter 17. 
Because Jesus quotes more Bible. He's not acknowledging some contradiction, first of all. Because that's, what, that's the next thing that people might want to say. Oh, well, there's a contradiction then. So are you saying that, that that's not true then? He's not going to let, you know, he will let your foot dash against a stone? Oh, well, that, you know, God's a liar then. No, 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 he's not. But you have to take it all in context. You have to understand the totality of it. There's nothing in that verse that would be a contradiction of God offering protection. Especially when you compare, because that's talking about someone who's putting their trust in God. Well, if you're putting your trust in God, why are you going to go do something foolish anyways? I mean, there's, there's, there'd be no reason for that. Especially just to prove to the devil that you really are who you say you are. And, that, and by the way, that's another foolish thing anyways. Someone coming to you, because that's what Satan was doing in all three of his temptations to Jesus. Well, prove it. Right? Prove you really are the Son of God. And he's going off of his terms. So if someone comes to you to says like, oh, well, prove you're born again or whatever, right? All you need is the word of God. You don't need to go into some, like, let them say, oh, well, then if you're, if you're born of God, then why don't you speak in tongues, right? Why don't you heal me right now? Because the Bible says, you know, I'm going to give, I'm going to, you know, if any, or why don't you handle this snake, right? Because if you get bit by a snake, then it's not, it's the same exact mentality as that. The snake handlers, right? Is that, is that big out here in Georgia? Or no, I mean, it used to be maybe at one point. The people who, who handle the snakes, they want to show their faith because they take one verse out of context and take a verse that basically saying, hey, as you're doing the work of the Lord, God's going to protect you. That makes perfect sense. Okay, you don't have to worry about being afraid to go into certain areas. You know, Paul was shipwrecked and he was, you know, landed in this, in this area, but he didn't have to worry about being destroyed there because even when the serpent did bite him, God made sure that he was protected. That's a totally different thing from saying, hey, why don't you just go now because I said I'm going to protect you. Why don't you just go and just, just see how close to the line you get. Just prove me and test me at every moment. Whenever I say something, just go out and handle a bunch of snakes and be foolish about it. That's not what God's saying at all. So um, Jesus quotes more Bible to him. He says, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So in Deuteronomy 6.16, 6, you're in Exodus 17. This is what he's quoting. He's, he's demonstrating how Satan is perverting the Scripture just to suit his own needs. Deuteronomy 6.16 6, says, Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massa. Now follow along with me because in Exodus 17, we're going to see what happened in Massa. It all ties together. Because Jesus quotes, you know, don't tempt the Lord your God. That's all he says to him, but the rest of that verse says, as ye tempted him in Massa. So in the same way that the children of Israel tempted the Lord in Massa. So let's look at Exodus 17 to see that story. Verse number one. The Bible reads, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? So are saying, Why are you tempting God? And that word tempt just means like to test. Why are you testing? Why? And, and you know, if they're testing God in this way, basically they're doubting God. Why are you testing God? What, do you think God's going to bring you out here just to destroy you? Because that's what they were saying. Like, oh, you brought us out of Egypt just to destroy us in the wilderness. Oh, you brought us this far. You let us here. And now there's no water and we're all going to die. And they're, they're complaining and chiding and arguing with Moses about all this stuff. He's like, why are you tempting God? And, and this is just a side note. Anyways, not part of the sermon. We need to be careful about having this type of an attitude in our lives. Because the Bible does say, you know, that uh, I've, been, I've been young and now I'm old, and I've yet to see his seed begging bread. And that we have the promises of God. We have promises if we're to live a righteous life. God is going to watch out for us. God is going to protect us. God will give us provision. He'll give us food and clothing. And he gives us that stuff. But to have this attitude then, if something starts going a little bit wrong or times get a little bit difficult, to have this complaining, bitter attitude, saying, well, what, where are you, God? I thought that you were going to, 
you know, take care of things for me and start testing God and tempting God based off of, you know, some situation you're in instead of just trusting, you know what, he will get me through this. And knowing that, well, because he promised, because as, as, as sure as we can trust our salvation, we can trust that everything that the Bible says is true. We can trust God completely and we should have no reason to doubt him no matter what's going on around us at all. And when we start tempting and testing God in that manner, that becomes sinful. Look at verse number three. It says, And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. So they're getting really upset with Moses. I mean, they're ready to kill him. And the Lord said unto Moses, verse number five, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river, Take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock and Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the, children of, uh, because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So I started doubting and questioning. Would you mind turning those, um, trying to hit some more light switches? I know all these go on. I turned them off before we left. Just hit a couple of those, see if we could get any more to come on. Oh, that one did that side. So. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll make do with what we can. But, um. Ultimately, though, what, what they were chiding and what they were tempting, it says, it, it boiled down to them not believing, is God with us or not? Is the Lord among us? Is he really here? After he's already showed them all these miracles in Egypt, after he's already parted the Red Sea, after he's already seen all this stuff, and now they're saying, well, is God with us or not? Because we're getting thirsty. And this is exactly what Satan was trying to get Jesus to do. Well, is God really with you? Why don't you test it? Why, uh, we, we see this in the scripture. Why don't you throw yourself off this mountain? Is God really with you? And try to get Jesus to doubt. Now, obviously, he's not going to doubt because he's perfect, but um, turn if you would to Psalm 78. But that was Satan's plan nonetheless, and Satan's going to use these same devices. So why am I even preaching this? You know, it's, it's so that you can be more firmed up. One, you could understand the way that Satan is going to try to get bad doctrine into churches or maybe into your mind or whatever and just get them out there to, to see it and be able to spot it and combat against it. But also, just as we go through some of these stories so that you know, you're more grounded and rooted and founded in the truth and not tempting God yourself. Now, let's keep going here. Verse number, we're in Psalm 78, hopefully. Psalm 78, verse number... 17 is where we're going to start reading. Psalm 78, verse number 17, about reads, And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. This is another record of the children of Israel in their, in their um, tempting God. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger also came up against Israel because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of the corn of heaven. God had already, you know, he, he, he gave them this stuff and they're still just continue to doubt. And they're still just saying, is, is God here? They don't, they're not believing in God. And this is ultimately um, where we don't want to end up, obviously, not believing in God's word and not believing in his truth. Now turn, if you would, to James chapter 1 because... All this talk about tempting, I just want to point out another false doctrine 
that people might try to point out or some, some contradiction that someone might want to try, try to point out in the Bible by some unbelieving atheist or someone who already doesn't believe God. And it's another example of taking things out of context. That's why we're going. This is kind of flowing together with the, the idea of being tempted or tempting God or God tempting man. In James chapter 1, we're going to see some scripture twisting or at least the way that people will present it. In James chapter 1, the Bible says in verse number 13, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So in this passage, we're getting an understanding of, of a particular situation or typ a particular type of temptation. But what people will want to do, and this is what I'm talking about zooming in maybe too closely and just isolating part of a verse instead of understanding the whole context, is they'll take in verse number 13 there, James chapter 1, and that last phrase, neither tempteth he any man. And they'll say, well, see, God doesn't tempt any man. So God doesn't tempt anyone, right? According to the Bible here, well, what about when God tempted Abraham? Because in Genesis 22, verse 1, the Bible says, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am, and he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and after him, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. So people want to take that one little phrase, well, neither tempteth thee any man. See? Well, there you got a contra contradiction. It's not God's word, right? And they just want to throw the, like, see? Ha ha. You're defeated. There's a contradiction. It can't be God's word. Well, no. When you get James 1.13 in context, what is he talking about here? Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Here's the key. And then it gives a colon. When, this is why he's saying when, when you are tested, when you go through a temptation, don't blame God. It says, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. And he goes, he goes further with that colon explaining neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. This is referring to the temptation to do wickedness, to do sin, to do evil. Because in the flesh, our flesh has that temptation of wanting to do those things. Okay, God is not, you know, bringing evil to you to try to entice you to do evil. That's not what God is. God doesn't do that. He's not going to try to, he's not like trying to get you to sin. That's a different type of temptation. And that's the temptation he's referring to. He's not just trying to make you stumble and fall. God's not just putting these, these stumbling blocks all in front of you, you know, as a child of God, trying to, to get you to sin. The temptation that comes is when he's trying your faith. That's when he's tempting you, not trying to get you to sin, not because you're, you know, he explains there in James 1, that's your own lust. The own lust of your flesh is trying to get you into sin. And you need to resist that temptation. But the temptation, like he tempted Abraham, he's testing Abraham's faith in God's word and in God's promise to offer up his only son as a sacrifice and just seeing, hey, do, is his faith really this high? Does he have enough faith to trust that if I tell him to do something, even as, as you know, um, extreme as offering up his only son, that I've already told him is going to receive these blessings. I've already given him these promises. Is he going to trust me and take me at my word and follow through with this because he knows that I can't go back on what I said? That's the way he tempts Abraham. He tempts, you know, other people similarly to try them, to try their faith, to try the integrity of your heart, to see, are you really going to just back off from God or not? Are you going to just stay with him? There's a big difference between that type of temptation and just, you know, like God trying to put porn in front of a guy's face or something to get him to, to sin and, and commit adultery in his heart or something. God's not doing that. He's not trying to get you to do it. But that is something that Satan will do. 
That's the way that Satan operates. See, Satan will put the facade on sin and try to, to doll it up and make it look real pretty and try to get you to be tempted to go in to commit fornication or adultery or whatever form of wickedness that he's going to try to get you to stumble and fall. But that's not the way that God tempts people. It's a two different types of temptation, if you will. So you can't use a passage like James 1, 13, just that last few words on there to try to come up with some contradiction in the Bible. It doesn't make any sense. You're not using... Uh, and, don't, and don't let people... See, here, here's a problem. When people are trying to teach false doctrine... And this is hard to do because I'm not saying you can't ever talk to someone about doctrine, right? It, it's natural to talk to people and, and to discuss the Bible or whatever. But be very careful when, when people are trying to jump around, especially too fast, and they use just little bits and phrases. And Calvinists are real good about this, about getting you to think about the Scripture in their twisted way of interpreting the Scripture. And, and they'll, they'll try to throw a lot of verses at you. Because there are a lot of verses that they'll use, right? I'll give them that. They'll go to, to Romans 8 and 9, and, and they'll go to other places and try to, try to twist the Scripture and be like, oh, see, but this says here and here and here and here and here and here and here. And for the unlearned, it may sound convincing just because you're looking at that going, wow, there's a lot of Scripture there. It's kind of like going on someone's, a church's statement of faith and they just say, we believe this. And then they'll have like all these references in parentheses, right? And I bet you 99% of the people that read that will never go and look up those references. But they put them on there because at least it shows some level of authority. Oh, well, I mean, obviously there's all this scripture supporting what they believe, so that must be right. And, you know, God forbid that, that we would be like that, that we would just be accepting of what someone says because, oh, well, I sort of have this scripture, this scripture, this scripture. Well, what about First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 12, huh? What about, you know, and, and people will talk that way, and you don't know what that verse says off the top of your head, right? But, you're gonna, but, but it, it's a tactic that's used to try to, one, make the other person think that you know so much Bible. Well, you... To intimidate. It's an intimidation tactic to make you think, wow, this person, they must, well, I, I don't know the Bible that well, so maybe they're right. I mean, they must know what they're talking about because they know this so well. Beware of that. Don't accept anything that you hear. I don't care how well they sound like they know the Bible. Even from someone that's a good preacher, you know, I mean, it, it goes for everybody. Now, thank God he's given us the Holy Spirit to help us to discern what, you know, what we're hearing but you're not going to really be able to discern unless you have God's word already read. Already, you know, the only thing that that's going to help you with if you haven't read your Bible is the really, really, really bizarre, weird stuff. Like if you go to, you go, if you never read your Bible and you're saved and you go to one of these, you know, tongue speaking churches and you see people just flopping around on the ground, all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Yeah, the Holy Spirit's probably going to be like a get out of there. Right? Like you're just going to feel like this is not right. This is weird. But when it comes to doctrine, you're not always going to just be able to rely on that if you don't have Scripture already read. If you don't already know what the Bible says, it's going to be that much easier to be turned around and be twisted around. So, again, I'm going to reiterate read your Bible. <laughs> read it, read it, read it, read it, read it. You are responsible for what you believe. You are. Let's turn, if we would, to Matthew chapter 12. I want to I want to point out this is just one more instance that we see in the Bible of the Pharisees and the Sadducee type of an attitude and their interpretation of Scripture and they're twisting, they're perverting, twisted Scripture and not really getting the, the spirit of what the Bible is, is teaching as well as the letter. We need both. We definitely look at the letter of the law, but we need to also understand and um, consider the spirit in which it's given. We'll get, uh, we'll get, I'll explain exactly what I mean by, through this story. Look at Matthew 12. We're going to start reading verse number 1. The Bible reads, At that time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, 
And his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Verse 3, But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was in hunger and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. What he's explaining to them, see, they're looking at this at the law. And you can't do any work on the Sabbath, right? And that is a law, and that is a commandment, and that is something that ought to be followed for sure. But they, they've, they've focused in so close to that commandment that they've completely just lost the whole meaning behind the commandment. And when they get to the point to where they're saying, you know, as the disciples are preaching the gospel and they're hungry and they, they, you know, they're doing the work for the Lord on the Sabbath day, which was not forbidden for them to do, and they, they take an ear of corn and eat it, they're just real quick to just be like, oh man, they're doing that which is unlawful. Well, Jesus Christ himself said, you know, you would not have condemned the guiltless. They weren't guilty. In doing what they were doing, it didn't break the Sabbath. He likens it in other places saying, hey, which of you, you know, if you have an ox or an ass and they fall into a ditch, which of you is not going to actually help that, that ox or that ass get out of the ditch? You're not just going to leave it there. You're not just going to let it die because it's the Sabbath, you're going to help it out. And basically, he's explaining to them, look, you don't understand the spirit of the law. The law is important, no doubt. But it's not, it's not unlawful to do good just because it's the Sabbath. And that's the point he's making. You know, if you're going to heal somebody, like he was healing people, and they're, they're saying, oh, no, you're working. You totally just missed the whole point of what the Sabbath is all about in the teaching of, of the Sabbath being entering into God's rest. It has nothing to do with helping people. It's supposed to be your own works that you're refraining from, right? Because it's a picture of salvation. So you aren't supposed to be doing any work, your regular work. But if it has to do with, you know, someone fell down or someone got beat up or something, you know, something got an accident, oh, I can't do any, I can't break a sweat. So I can't help you. Sorry, I'm going to have to let you die. That's ridiculous, right? That's focusing in and zooming in too much onto one, you know, one phrase or one sentence as opposed to taking it all in context for what does it really mean. And this is, a, this is something that we need to be aware of. This is something that the, uh, the flat earthers do the very same thing. They want to zoom in on certain phrases and say, see, you know, the earth cannot be moved. Or whatever, whatever verse they want to point to to try to say, see, the earth is, it can't be round, it can't be a ball. And they just love throwing a ball around, it can't be a ball. Because they, they focus in on a few of these verses or phrases that when you get it in context, if you were to apply the verse the way they are, like, like extra literally, the same way the Pharisees were applying extra literally the, the, the Sabbath day, right? Like, do no work. Well, yeah, it says you should do no work, but they start applying that to things that's not meant to be applied to. Like the disciples eating some food while they're preaching the gospel. That's not what that was for. It's never what that was about. The same way the people like the, you know, the people who believe in this flat earth, they want to use scripture to prove it. They're taking this language that's saying, oh, see, the Bible says right here, it's, you know, um, and I'm, I don't even remember what their arguments are anymore. It's been a long time. I try not to deal with foolishness too much. <laughs> but um, it's, it's the same type of thing. You look at the language. And it, man, I wish I would have just gotten one example for you because the, the, the point is, is so easily made. When you, when you go to any one of their proof texts and just read the whole passage in context, 
just imagine taking the way that they're interpreting it and looking at like a literal, the saying, well, this is literally, word, but don't we take the word of God literally? Well, yeah, we do, but we also do it with common sense. Okay, like everything needs to be taken with, with common sense and understanding literature and the way that phrases are used to understand what is being conveyed. And when you just zoom in super close into something, you get yourself into all kinds of weird, weird troubles and weird doctrines. It's, it's a similar thing with like the people who believe in these, in the, what we call the Nephilim, right? The giants. And they'll try to, they'll, they'll take the, oh, that's what it is. They'll take the phrase where, well, we were like grasshoppers in their sight, right? This is a perfect example. We're like grasshoppers. So see, they had to be huge. I mean, think about it. How much taller are you than a grasshopper, right? So we take the, hey, we take the Bible literally. We take the word of God literally. So if they're saying that we were like grasshoppers in their sight, then they had to be on a magnitude of like a thousand times bigger than we are, right? I mean, why, well, the Word of God wouldn't say that unless it meant it, that, that we were really like grasshoppers in their sight. This is the type of stupidity and foolishness that if you just zoom in real close and you let these guys say, well, don't, don't you take the, Bible, the Word of God literally? Uh, uh, yeah, I do. I, I, yeah, I mean, I believe the Word. Well, I mean, isn't that what it says? Well, yeah, that's what it says. But, but I have a brain, okay? And, and I know a figure of speech when I see one. And even though, yeah, it's the Word of God, the Word of God, you know, it uses figures of speech. Have you ever read the Song of Solomon? It uses figures of speech. Yes, literally, the, the Bible is true. And overall, I mean, it's, it's very black and white. And it says what it says. But there are some phrases that you can't dig into too deeply or too profoundly to come up with some, some weird new doctrine that's just, that's just not right. Beware when people want to zoom in or isolate it. And they started extrapolating from that one verse. There's, there's a lot more uh, examples like that. These are just a few that I came up with um, regarding the, you know, the Sabbath day and what Satan was trying to do. These attacks are out there, but the, the best defense for this literally is just to read and study Scripture for yourself. Know what it says. Um, and, and don't... Don't let these people twist your mind with their twisted view of Scripture. Take the time. It's important enough. And if you're seriously having a conversation with someone where maybe they are causing you to have some kind of doubts in what you already believe about that because of what they're saying, it's not always a bad thing. I mean, if what they're saying is true, that's great, right? But you have to test it and test it by going through the effort of making a note of it and reading it out fully in context to get the whole picture. Don't be swayed easily by anybody of just, oh, well, they, they sounds like they know what they're talking about, so I'll just accept that. Be like the Bereans. You know, Paul, the apostle Paul was preaching to him. He was preaching him truth. Of course, he was. You know, he was bringing them good information and good stuff. Yet they still check those things daily, whether what he said was so. They were being diligent in what they believed in their doctrine, and we need to be the same way. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity we had to, to gather together today. And for all the souls that were saved out soul winning, God, I pray that you please bless them, help them to get into, into church, and that um, you'd, you'd work in their spirit to, to want to come here and, and get plugged into our church, dear Lord. Pray that you please just help us to gain more wisdom, more knowledge. Lord, help us to have a priority on our Bible reading and studying, and that we would not let that, um, just, just not slack off in, in doing those things, but we would treat it with utmost importance that we wouldn't be deceived by people who, like the Pharisees, like the Sadducees, that aren't even saved. Those people weren't even saved and they're just trying to interpret the Bible and try to twist, twist around people's minds and just like Satan is going to try to use the Word of God 
uh, against us to get us into sin. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to be wise and to, um, that you would lead us and guide us into all truth and wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.